Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Barb, Joey, Saima, and Brighton. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting us and helping us continue to make new sleepy episodes week after week, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's return to a volume that has proved time and again to be the most popular thing ever read on this podcast. The Book of Household Management, comprising information for the mistress, housekeeper, cook, kitchen maid, butler, footman, coachman, valet, upper and under housemaids, ladies maid, maid of all work, laundry maid, nurse and nursemaid, monthly wet and sick nurses, etc., etc. Also, sanitary, medical, and legal memoranda, with a history of the origin properties and uses of all things connected with home life and comfort by Mrs. Isabella Beaton, published originally by S.O. Beaton in 24 monthly parts from 1859 to 1861 and first published in a bound edition in 1861. This time, Let's return to the kitchen, where Mrs. Beaton spends most of this volume, and learn more about excellence in the art of cookery. Let's begin. Excellence in the art of cookery, as in all other things, is only attainable by practice and experience. In proportion, therefore, to the opportunities which a cook has had of these, so will be his excellence in the art. It is in the large establishments of princes, noblemen, and very affluent families alone that the man cook is found in this country. He also superintends the kitchens of large hotels, clubs, and public institutions, where he usually makes out the bills of fare, which are generally submitted to the principal for approval. To be able to do this, therefore, it is absolutely necessary that he should be a judge of the season of every dish, as well as know perfectly the state of every article he undertakes to prepare. He must also be a judge of every article he buys, for no skill however great it may be, will enable him to make that good which is really bad. On him rests the responsibility of the cooking generally, whilst a specialty of his department is to prepare the rich soups, stews, ragouts, and such dishes as enter into the more refined and complicated portions of his art and such as are not usually understood by ordinary professors. 
He therefore holds a high position in a household, being inferior in rank, as already shown, only to the house steward, the valet, and the butler. In the luxurious ages of Grecian antiquity, Sicilian cooks were the most esteemed and received high rewards for their services. Among them, one called Trimalcio was such an adept in his art that he could impart to common fish both the form and flavor of the most esteemed of the Piscatory tribes. A chief cook in the palmy days of Roman voluptuousness had about 800 pounds a year, and Antony rewarded the one that cooked the supper which pleased Cleopatra with the present of a city. With the fall of the empire, the culinary art sank into less consideration. In the Middle Ages, cooks labored to acquire a reputation for their sauces, which they composed of strange combinations for the sake of novelty as well as singularity. The duties of the cook, the kitchen, and the scullery maids are so intimately associated that they can hardly be treated of separately. The cook, however, is at the head of the kitchen, and in proportion to her possession of the qualities of cleanliness, neatness, order, regularity, and celerity of action, so will her influence appear in the conduct of those who are under her, as it is upon her that the whole responsibility of the business of the kitchen rests, whilst the others must lend her both a ready and a willing assistance, and be especially tidy in their appearance, and active in their movements. In the larger establishments of the Middle Ages, cooks, with the authority of feudal chiefs, gave their orders from a high chair in which they ensconced themselves, and commanded a view of all that was going on throughout their several domains. Each held a long wooden spoon, with which he tasted, without leaving his seat, the various comestibles that were cooking on the stoves, and which he frequently used as a rod of punishment on the backs of those whose idleness and gluttony too largely predominated over their diligence and temperance. If, as we have said, the quality of early rising be of the first importance to the mistress, what must it be to the servant? Let it therefore be taken as a long-proved truism that without it, in every domestic, the effect of all things else so far as work is concerned may in a great measure be neutralized. In a cook this quality is most essential, for an hour lost in the morning will keep her toiling, absolutely toiling, all day to overtake that which might otherwise have been achieved with ease. In large establishments, six is a good hour to rise in the summer, and seven in the winter. Her first duty in large establishments, and where it is requisite, should be to set her dough for the breakfast rolls, provided this has not been done on the previous night and then to engage herself with those numerous little preliminary occupations, which may not inappropriately be termed laying out her duties for the day. This will bring in the breakfast hour of eight, after which directions must be given and preparations made for the different dinners of the household and family. In those numerous households where a cook and housemaid are only kept, the general custom is that the cook should have the charge of the dining room. The hall, the lamps, and the doorstep are also committed to her care, and any other work there may be on the outside of the house. 
In establishments of this kind, the cook will, after having lighted her kitchen fire, carefully brushed the range and cleaned the hearth, proceed to prepare for breakfast. She will thoroughly rinse the kettle and filling it with fresh water, will put it on the fire to boil. She will then go to the breakfast room or parlor and there make all things ready for the breakfast of the family. Her attention will next be directed to the hall, which she will sweep and wipe. The kitchen stairs, if there be any, will now be swept, and the hall mats, which have been removed and shaken, will be again put in their places. The cleaning of the kitchen, pantry, passages, and kitchen stairs must always be over before breakfast so that it may not interfere with the other business of the day. Everything should be ready and the whole house should wear a comfortable aspect when the heads of the house and members of the family make their appearance. Nothing it may be depended on will so please the mistress of an establishment as to notice that, although she has not been present to see that the work was done, attention to smaller matters has been carefully paid with a view to giving her satisfaction and increasing her comfort. By the time that the cook has performed the duties mentioned above and well swept, brushed and dusted her kitchen, the breakfast bell will most likely summon her to the parlor to bring in the breakfast. It is the cook's department generally in the smaller establishments to wait at breakfast, as the housemaid by this time has gone upstairs into the bedrooms and has there applied herself to her various duties. The cook usually answers the bells and single knocks at the door in the early part of the morning as the tradesmen with whom it is her more special business to speak call at these hours. It is in her preparation of the dinner that the cook begins to feel the weight and responsibility of her situation as she must take upon herself all the dressing and the serving of the principal dishes, which her skill and ingenuity have mostly prepared. Whilst these, however, are cooking, she must be busy with her pastry, soups, gravies, ragouts, etc. Stock, or what the French call consommé, being the basis of most made dishes, must be always at hand, in conjunction with her sweet herbs and spices for seasoning. A place for everything, and everything in its place, must be her rule, in order that time may not be wasted in looking for things when they are wanted, and in order that the whole apparatus of cooking may move with the regularity and precision of a well-adjusted machine. All must go on simultaneously. The vegetables and sauces must be ready with the dishes they are to accompany, and in order that they may be suitable, the smallest oversight must not be made in their preparation. When the dinner hour has arrived, it is the duty of the cook to dish up such dishes as may without injury stand for some time, covered on the hot plate or in the hot closet. But such as are of a more important or recherche kind must be delayed until the order to serve is given from the drawing room. Then comes haste, but there must be no hurry. All must work with order. The cook takes charge of the fish, soups, and poultry, and the kitchen maid of the vegetables, sauces, and gravies. These she puts into the appropriate dishes, whilst the scullery maid waits on and assists the cook. 
everything must be timed so as to prevent its getting cold. Whilst great care should be taken that between the first and second courses, no more time is allowed to elapse than is necessary for fear that the company in the dining room lose all relish for what has yet to come of the dinner. When the dinner has been served, the most important feature in the daily life of the cook is at an end. She must, however, now begin to look to the contents of her larder, taking care to keep everything sweet and clean, so that no disagreeable smells may arise from the gravies, milk, or meat that may be there. These are the principal duties of a cook in a first-rate establishment. In smaller establishments, the housekeeper often conducts the higher department of cooking, and the cook, with the assistance of a scullery maid, performs some of the subordinate duties of the kitchen maid. When circumstances render it necessary, the cook engages to perform the whole of the work of the kitchen, and in some places, a portion of the housework also. Whilst the cook is engaged with her morning duties, the kitchen maid is also occupied with hers. Her first duty, after the fire is lighted, is to sweep and clean the kitchen and the various offices belonging to it. This she does every morning, besides cleaning the stone steps at the entrance of the house, the halls, the passages, and the stairs which lead to the kitchen. Her general duties besides these are to wash and scour all these places twice a week with the tables, shelves, and cupboards. She has also to dress the nursery and servants' hall dinners, to prepare all fish, poultry, and vegetables, trim meat joints and cutlets, and do all such duties as may be considered to enter into the cook's department in a subordinate degree. The duties of the scullery maid are to assist the cook, to keep the scullery clean, and all the metallic as well as earthenware kitchen utensils. The position of scullery maid is not, of course, one of high rank, nor is the payment for her services large. But if she be fortunate enough to have over her a good kitchen maid and clever cook, she may very soon learn to perform various little duties connected with cooking operations, which may be of considerable service in fitting her for a more responsible place. Now, it will be doubtless thought by the majority of our readers that the fascinations connected with the position of the scullery maid are not so great as to induce many people to leave a comfortable home in order to work in a scullery. But we are acquainted with one instance in which the desire on the part of a young girl was so strong to become connected with the kitchen and cookery that she absolutely left her parents and engaged herself as a scullery maid in a gentleman's house. Here she showed herself so active and intelligent that she very quickly rose to the rank of kitchen maid, and from this, so great was her gastronomical genius, she became in a short space of time one of the best women cooks in England. After this, we think, it must be allowed that a cook, like a poet, nasciter non fit. Modern cookery stands so greatly indebted to the gastronomic propensities of our French neighbors that many of their terms are adopted and applied by English artists to the same as well as similar preparations of their own. A vocabulary of these is, therefore, indispensable in a work of this kind. Accordingly, the following will be found sufficiently complete for all ordinary purposes. Explanation of French terms 
used in modern household cookery. Aspic, a savory jelly used as an exterior molding for cold game, poultry, fish, etc. This, being of a transparent nature, allows the bird which it covers to be seen through it. This may also be used for decorating or garnishing. Assiette or plate. Assiettes are the small entrees and hors d'oeuvres, the quantity of which does not exceed what a plate will hold. At dessert, fruits, cheese, chestnuts, biscuits, etc., if served upon a plate, are termed assiettes. Assiette volant is a dish which a servant hands round to the guests, but is not placed upon the table. Small cheese souffles and different dishes, which ought to be served very hot, are frequently made assiette volant. Au bleu, fish dressed in such a manner as to have a bluish appearance. Bain marie, an open saucepan or kettle of nearly boiling water, in which a smaller vessel can be set for cooking and warming. This is very useful for keeping articles hot without altering their quantity or quality. If you keep sauce, broth, or soup by the fireside, the soup reduces and becomes too strong, and the sauce thickens as well as reduces. But this is prevented by using the bain-marie, in which the water should be very hot, but not boiling. Bechamel, French white sauce, now frequently used in English cookery. Blanch, to whiten poultry, vegetables, fruit, etc., by plunging them into boiling water for a short time, and afterwards plunging them into cold water, there to remain until they are cold. Blanquette, a sort of fricassee. Bouilly, a French dish resembling hasty pudding. Bouillon, a thin broth or soup. Braise, to stew meat with fat bacon until it is tender, it having previously been blanched. Brasicre, a saucepan having a lid with ledges to put fire on the top. Bride, to pass a pack thread through poultry game, etc., to keep together their members. Caramel, burnt sugar. This is made with a piece of sugar of the size of a nut, browned in the bottom of a saucepan, upon which a cupful of stock is gradually poured, stirring all the time a glass of broth, little by little, it may be used with the feather of a quill to color meats, such as the upper part of fricando, and to impart color to sauces. Caramel made with water instead of stock may be used to color compotes and other entremets. Casserole A crust of rice which, after having been molded into the form of a pie, is baked and then filled with a fricassee of white meat or a puree of game. Compote, a stew, as a fruit or pigeons. Consomme, rich stock or gravy. Croquette, ball of fried rice or potatoes. Croutons, sippets of bread. Dobicre, an oval stew pan in which dobes are cooked, dobes being meat or fowl stewed in sauce. De saucé, to bone 
or take out the bones from poultry, game, or fish. This is an operation requiring considerable experience. Entrees Small side or corner dishes served with the first course. Entremet Small side or corner dishes served with the second course. Escallop Collops Small, round, thin pieces of tender meat or a fish, beaten with the handle of a strong knife to make them tender. Foyotage, puff paste. Flambe, to singe fowl or game after they have been picked. Fonce, to put in the bottom of a saucepan slices of ham veal, or thin broad slices of bacon. Galette, a broad, thin cake. Gâteau, a cake, correctly speaking, but used sometimes to denote a pudding and a kind of tart. Glacé, to glaze or spread upon hot meats or larded fowl a thick and rich sauce or gravy called glaze. This is laid on with a feather or brush, and in confectionery, the term means to ice fruits and pastry with sugar, which glistens on hardening. Hors d'oeuvre, small dishes or assiette volante of sardines, anchovies, and other relishes of this kind served to the guests during the first course. Lee, a bed or layer. Articles in thin slices are placed in layers, other articles or seasoning being laid between them. Maigre, broth, soup or gravy made without meat. Matelote, a rich fish stew, which is generally composed of carp, eels, trout, or barbel. It is made with wine. Mayonnaise, cold sauce or salad dressing. Menu, the bill of fare. Meringue, a kind of icing made of whites of eggs and sugar well beaten. Miraton, larger slices of meat than collops, such as slices of beef for a vinaigrette, or ragu or stew of onions. Mouillé, to add water, broth, or other liquid during the cooking. Paner, to cover over with very fine crumbs of bread, meats, or any other articles to be cooked on the gridiron, in the oven, or frying pan. Pique, to lard with strips of fat bacon, poultry, game, meat, etc. This should always be done according to the vein of the meat, so that in carving, you slice the bacon across as well as the meat. Poulet, stock used instead of water for boiling turkeys, sweetbreads, fowls, and vegetables to render them less insipid. This is rather an expensive preparation. Puree, Vegetables or meat reduced to a very smooth pulp, which is afterwards mixed with enough liquid to make it of the consistency of very thick soup. Ragu, stew or hash. Remoulade, salad dressing. Rissoles, pastry made of light puff paste and cut into various forms and fried. They may be filled with fish, 
meat or sweets. Roux, brown and white, French thickening. Salmi, ragu of game previously roasted. Sauce piquant, a sharp sauce in which somewhat of a vinegar flavor predominates. Saute, to dress with sauce in a saucepan, repeatedly moving it about. Tami, a sort of open cloth or sieve through which to strain broth and sauces so as to rid them of small bones, froth, etc. Tort, a tart, a fruit pie. Trousse, to truss a bird, to put together the body and tie the wings and thighs in order to round it for roasting or boiling, each being tied then with pack thread to keep it in the required form. Vol au vent, a rich crust of very fine puff paste which may be filled with various delicate ragouts or fricassees of fish, flesh, or fowl. Fruit may also be enclosed in a vol au vent. Soup Recipes Almond Soup Ingredients 4 pounds of lean beef or veal one half a scrag of mutton, one ounce of vermicelli, four blades of mace, six cloves, one half pound of sweet almonds, the yolks of six eggs, one gill of thick cream, and rather more than two quarts of water. Mode Boil the beef or veal and the mutton gently in water that will cover them till the gravy is very strong and the meat very tender. Then strain off the gravy and set it on the fire with the specified quantities of vermicelli, mace, and cloves to two quarts. Let it boil till it has the flavor of the spices. Have ready the almonds, blanched and pounded very fine, the yolks of the eggs boiled hard, mixing the almonds whilst pounding with a little of the soup, lest the latter should grow oily. Pound them till they are a mere pulp, and keep adding to them by degrees a little soup until they are thoroughly mixed together. Let the soup be cool when mixing, and do it perfectly smooth. Strain it through a sieve, set it on the fire, stir frequently, and serve hot. Just before taking it up, add the cream. Time, three hours. Average cost per quart, two shillings, three pence. Seasonable all the year, sufficient for eight persons. The Almond Tree This tree is indigenous to the northern parts of Asia and Africa, but it is now cultivated in Europe, especially in the south of France, Italy, and Spain. It flowers in spring and produces its fruit in August. Although there are two kinds of almonds, the sweet and the bitter, they are considered as only varieties of the same species. The best sweet almonds brought to England are called the Syrian or Jordan and come from Malaga. The inferior qualities are brought from Valencia and Italy. Bitter almonds come principally from Magadore. Anciently, the almond was much esteemed by the nations of the East. Jacob included it among the presents which he designed for Joseph. The Greeks called it the Greek or Thacian nut, 
and the Romans believed that by eating half a dozen of them, they were secured against drunkenness, however deeply they might imbibe. Almonds, however, are considered as very indigestible. The bitter contain two principles which produce two violent poisons, prussic acid and a kind of volatile oil. It is consequently dangerous to eat them in large quantities. Almonds pounded together with a little sugar and water, however, produce a milk similar to that which is yielded by animals. Their oil is used for making fine soap and their cake as a cosmetic. Apple Soup Ingredients 2 pounds of good boiling apples 3 quarter teaspoonful of white pepper 6 cloves Cayenne or ginger to taste 3 quarts of medium stock Mode Peel and quarter the apples, taking out their cores Put them into the stock Stew them gently till tender Rub the whole through a strainer, add the seasoning, give it one boil up, and serve. Time, one hour. Average cost per quart, one shilling. Seasonable from September to December. Sufficient for ten persons. The Apple this useful fruit is mentioned in Holy Writ, and Homer describes it as valuable in his time. It was brought from the East by the Romans, who held it in the highest estimation. Indeed, some of the citizens of the Eternal City distinguished certain favorite apples by their names. Thus the Manlians were called after Manlius, the Claudians after Claudius, and the Appians after Appius. Others were designated after the country whence they were brought, as the Sidonians, the Epirotes, and the Greeks. The best varieties are natives of Asia, and have, by grafting them upon others, been introduced into Europe. The crab, found in our hedges, is the only variety indigenous to Britain. Therefore, for the introduction of other kinds, we are no doubt indebted to the Romans. In the time of the Saxon Heptarchy, both Devon and Somerset were distinguished as the apple country, and there are still existing in Herefordshire some trees said to have been planted in the time of William the Conqueror. From that time to this, the varieties of this precious fruit have gone on increasing and are now said to number upwards of 1,500. It is peculiar to the temperate zone, being found neither in Lapland nor within the tropics. The best baking apples for early use are the Colvilles, the best for autumn are the rennets and pearmains, and the best for winter and spring are russets. The best table or eating apples are the margarets for early use, the Kentish codlin and summer pearmain for summer, and for autumn, winter, or spring, the downton, golden, and other pippins as the ribstone with small russets. As a food, the apple cannot be considered to rank high, as more than the half of it consists of water, and the rest of its properties are not the most nourishing. It is, however, a useful adjunct to other kinds of food, and when cooked, is esteemed as slightly laxative. Artichoke or Jerusalem Soup A white soup Ingredients 3 slices of lean bacon or ham 
one half a head of celery, one turnip, one onion, three ounces of butter, four pounds of artichokes, one pint of boiling milk, or one half pint of boiling cream, salt and cayenne to taste, two lumps of sugar, two and one half quarts of white stock. Mode. Put the bacon and vegetables, which should be cut into thin slices, into the stew pan with the butter. Braise these for one quarter of an hour, keeping them well stirred. Wash and pare the artichokes, and after cutting them into thin slices, add them with a pint of stock to the other ingredients. When these have gently stewed down to a smooth pulp, put in the remainder of the stock. Stir it well, adding the seasoning, and when it has simmered for five minutes, pass it through a strainer. Now pour it back into the stew pan. Let it again simmer five minutes, taking care to skim it well, and stir it to the boiling milk or cream. Serve with small sippets of bread fried in butter. Time, one hour. Average cost per quart, one shilling, two pence. Seasonable from June to October. Sufficient for eight persons. Asparagus soup, one. Ingredients, five pounds of lean beef, three slices of bacon, one half pint of pale ale, a few leaves of white beet, spinach, one cabbage lettuce, a little mint, sorrel, and marjoram, a pint of asparagus tops cut small, the crust of one French roll, seasoning to taste, two quarts of water. Mode. Put the beef cut in pieces and rolled in flour into a stew pan with the bacon at the bottom. Cover it close and set it on a slow fire, stirring it now and then till the gravy is drawn. Put in the water and ale and season to taste with pepper and salt and let it stew gently for two hours. Then strain the liquor and take off the fat, and add the white beet, spinach, cabbage lettuce, and mint, sorrel, and sweet marjoram, pounded. Let these boil up in the liquor, then put in the asparagus tops cut small, and allow them to boil till all is tender. Serve hot with the French roll in the dish. Time, altogether three hours. Average cost per quart, one shilling, nine pence. Seasonable from May to August. Sufficient for eight persons. Asparagus soup, two. Ingredients, one and one half pint of split peas, a teacupful of gravy, four young onions, one lettuce cut small, one half a head of celery, one half a pint of asparagus cut small, one half a pint of cream, three quarts of water. Color the soup with spinach juice. Mode. Boil the peas and rub them through a sieve. Add the gravy and then stew by themselves the celery, onions, lettuce, and asparagus with the water. After this, stew all together and add the coloring and cream and serve. Time. Peas, two and one half hours. Vegetables, one hour. All together, four hours. Average cost per quart, 
one shilling. Asparagus. The ancients called all the sprouts of young vegetables asparagus, whence the name, which is now limited to a particular species, embracing artichoke, alisander, asparagus, cardoon, rampion, and sea kale. They are originally mostly wild seacoast plants, and in this state, asparagus may still be found on the northern as well as southern shores of Britain. It is often vulgarly called in London sparrow grass, and in its cultivated form, hardly bears any resemblance to the original plant. Immense quantities of it are raised for the London market at Mortlake and Deptford, but it belongs rather to the classes of luxurious than necessary food. It is light and easily digested, but is not very nutritious. Baked Soup Ingredients One pound of any kind of meat any trimmings or odd pieces, two onions, two carrots, two ounces of rice, one pint of split peas, pepper and salt to taste, four quarts of water. Mode. Cut the meat and vegetables in slices. Add to them the rice and peas. Season with pepper and salt. Put the whole in a jar. Fill up with the water. Cover very closely and bake for four hours. Time, four hours. Average cost, two and one half pence per quart. Seasonable at any time. Sufficient for ten or twelve persons. Note. This will be found a very cheap and wholesome soup, and will be convenient in those cases where baking is more easily performed than boiling. Barley Soup Ingredients 2 pounds of shin of beef 1 quarter pound of pearl barley A large bunch of parsley 4 onions 6 potatoes Salt and pepper, four quarts of water. Mode. Put in all the ingredients and simmer gently for three hours. Time, three hours. Average cost, two and one half pence per quart. Seasonable all the year, but more suitable for winter. Barley. This, in the order of cereal grasses, is in Britain the next plant to wheat in point of value, and exhibits several species and varieties. From what country it comes originally is not known, but it was cultivated in the earliest ages of antiquity, as the Egyptians were afflicted with the loss of it in the ear in the time of Moses. It was a favorite grain with the Athenians, but it was esteemed as an ignominious food by the Romans. Notwithstanding this, however, it was much used by them, as it was in former times by the English, and still is in the border countries, in Cornwall and also in Wales. In other parts of England, it is used mostly for malting purposes. It is less nutritive than wheat, and in 100 parts, has of starch 79, gluten 6, saccharin matter 7, husk 8. It is, however, a lighter and less stimulating food than wheat, which renders a decoction of it well adapted for invalids whose digestion is weak. Bread Soup Economical Ingredients 1 pound of bread crusts 
two ounces of butter, one quart of common stock. Mode. Boil the bread crust in the stock with the butter. Beat the whole with a spoon and keep it boiling till the bread and stock are well mixed. Season with a little salt. Time. Half an hour. Average cost per quart, fourpence. Seasonable at any time. Sufficient for four persons. Note, this is a cheap recipe and will be found useful where extreme economy is an object. Bread. The origin of bread is involved in the obscurity of distant ages. The Greeks attributed its invention to Pan, but before they themselves had an existence, it was, no doubt, in use among the primitive nations of mankind. The Chaldeans and the Egyptians were acquainted with it, and Sarah, the companion of Abraham, mixed flour and water together, kneaded it, and covered it with ashes on the hearth. The scriptures inform us that leavened bread was known to the Israelites, but it is not known when the art of fermenting it was discovered. It is said that the Romans learnt it during their wars with Perseus, king of Macedon, and that it was introduced to the imperial city about two hundred years before the birth of Christ. With them it no doubt found its way into Britain, but after their departure from the island, it probably ceased to be used. We know that King Alfred allowed the unfermented cakes to burn in the Nethard's cottage, and that even in the 16th century, unfermented cakes kneaded by the women were the only kind of bread known to the inhabitants of Norway and Sweden. The Italians of this day consume the greater portion of their flour in the form of polenta, or soft pudding, vermicelli, and macaroni, and in the remoter districts of Scotland, much unfermented bread is still used. We give a cut of the quern grinding mill, which towards the end of the last century was in use in that country and which is thus described by Dr. Johnson in his Journey to the Hebrides. Quote, it consists of two stones about a foot and a half in diameter. The lower is a little convex, to which the concavity of the upper must be fitted. In the middle of the upper stone is a round hole, and on one side is a long handle. The grinder sheds the corn gradually into the hole with one hand, and works the handle round with the other. The corn slides down the convexity of the lower stone, and by the motion of the upper, is ground in its passage. End quote. Such a primitive piece of machinery, it may safely be said, has entirely disappeared from this country. In other parts of this work, we shall have opportunities of speaking of bread and bread-making, which from its great and general use in the nourishment of mankind, has emphatically been called the staff of life. The necessity, therefore, of having it both pure and good is of the first importance. And on that note, with which I'm sure the author of the History of Bread would agree, I think we'll end this evening's reading from the Book of Household Management by Mrs. Isabella Beaton. Honestly, I really enjoy reading recipes to you, and I hope you enjoy that as well because we have hundreds of pages to go, but we'll leave that for another time. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, and maybe try some of these recipes on your own, 
As always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me on social media is Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.